and uh, one of our scientific societies, the Geological Society, recognised it publicly only a couple of months ago. Although at times you say that it's a metaphor as well. Well, it, Gaia is a metaphor. Um, it, the very words are metaphor. But then metaphors are used in science all the time. The selfish gene is a metaphor, but it was very useful in helping us to Well, understand. I mean, since you mentioned the selfish gene, Dawkins has been very hard on... Only in, in the hypothesis days, not now. Right. So you've reached an accommodation with the scientific community, do you I think? think so. Well, yes, as I said, the Geological Society gave me their highest award, which is the Wollaston Medal, solely for Gaia theory. It states so in the citation. So, what do you, what do you think the, the main achievement of the theory has been? I, th I think it's um, done quite a lot underground almost in making scientists realise that they can't live in little tiny compartments separated. They, it, when you're dealing with the Earth, you've got to look at it as a whole system. It's almost, again, think of it as something alive. It's no use going to, um, if, you, if you've got something wrong with your foot, to a gynaecologist, for example, or, or if there's something wrong with your brain, to an otolaryngologist. It, and science has been too much specialised without any GPs. I consider myself one of the first GPs in the science setup. It seems to me that the, the interaction that the, the Gaia hypothesis, the Gaia theory, explains is in large part responsible for our crisis because exactly. you have the positive feedback going on. Is that the way you see it's it? It's unhealthy, uh, which means it's impositive feedback. And yes, what we're doing is aggravating it. Right. So, as um, in effect, we're getting more dark daisies at Absolutely. this particular point. That's right. An overgrowth of dark daisies. Right. It, it, it sum summarizes yeah. our, our so, just to return to what you describe as your inherent optimism, how, how do you feel about your, your grandchildren's future? I've asked them, um, those that I've contacted, and uh, they're like I was, you see. I think of it now in the same way as I thought about World War II when I was a young student in uh, the uh, 1930s. And uh, in 1940, we were threatened by invasion from a powerful enemy that almost certainly would, m might have succeeded. We thought so. We thought that everything was, yeah, I mean, we could have thrown up our arms and said, oh, well, we'll just have to learn German or go to the Belsons or die or whatever. Uh, but we, as you know, we didn't. Uh, we were optimistic. I lived through those times. People were amazingly cheerful during World War II. Sounds like this time around we might all have to learn German, however. Yes. Well, we <laughs> learn Gaian. Yeah. <laughs> yes. One of, one, of the, I mean, one of the many interesting things about your career is that you spent a long time working with Shell. Yes. You were an advisor to Shell. That's right. Now, I mean, many, many of the environmentalists, many of the Greens say that this was a huge sellout because Shell sell is one out. of the sell out well, because they take it, they're working with it themselves Greenpeace and whatnot work with BP but in those days uh, Shell was you know one of the companies that was encouraging us to use as many fossil fuels as possible well exactly well don't forget when I work, was first invited to work for Shell that was 1965 it's a long time ago and most people were not thinking of green things at all at that time and when they did start thinking, it was the publication of Rachel Carson's book. And it's interesting to observe what was Shell's response to that. It voluntarily stopped manufacturing pesticides before it was legally required to do so. Which, of course, in turn raises another irony, because you've said people overreacted to pesticides. Yes. You know, I mean, I bring know, back I know, DDT. I know, I know. Now, this is weird, because it gets... Wisely. Well, and it gets more complicated still, because... It was your electron capture detector, yeah. your invention, that enabled Rachel Carson to write The Silent Spring in large part because, well, it, well confirmed. it confirmed the existence of pesticides throughout yeah. the planet. Yes. Yeah. And though, so you were instrumental and, in... And found the CFCs too. That's right. That you were instrumental in getting the pesticides banned, much, it seems... I didn't tell, tell to your, to well, them. you know, what was that an unintended consequence of a of a multifaceted career. 
It, it, absolutely. Well, I talked about mistakes all the time, and I made lots of mistakes. I acknowledge it. It's the only way you learn. But was that a mistake, do you think? In a way, yes. I should, should have spoken up more forcibly and said, hey, hold a minute, these things are not purely harmful. They have benefits. I suspect, I suspect another what you might call a mistake, and I, and I suspect it's mistaken understanding, is that when your electron capture detector discovered that the CFCs were very high, you said that the concentrations were not harmful. No, it didn't discover that they were very high. It discovered them when they were, in your part of the world, Southern Hemisphere, 40 parts per trillion. Ubiquitous? Uh, you, yes, yes, 40 parts per trillion. Right. An almost trivial amount. And so... And no danger to the world whatsoever. In toxicity? In toxicity or to the ozone. All right. At that, at that level. It but was only when they got up towards the part per billion that they became dangerous. And so did you continue to measure them as they rose, yes. or did somebody else? No, I set so up there was the, a point at which you realised that it was... I set up the global monitoring network yeah. called the ALE network, Atmospheric Long Range Experiment. Another irony then, an atmospheric irony, is that we're busy reducing the amount of aerosols that we use, which presumably will exacerbate the global yes, warming. Absolutely. Get rid of acid rain and make global warming worse. I mean, it does feel a bit of a no-win situation, doesn't it? it in many ways, it is, yes. It, it, you have, but you have to bear in mind, I don't think that we can do anything in the way of curing the Earth. Once if the penny drops in America, they'll try to. They'll say, we can fix it. But they won't succeed. It's a bit like when your kidneys fail, you can go on dialysis, but it won't buy, do anything but buy you a bit more time. And it's the same with the earth. Any sort of remedies we try will just buy a bit of time at the most. Mm. And they're likely to raise more problems than they solve. You see, you, you drew a, a huge audience here in Cheltenham today. And there were many, many questions. And, and one recurring theme was, but what can we do I know, as individuals? I know, and I wish I could answer that more effectively. I mean, telling people to cheer up, as you did, is not going to do it. <laughs> well, it I'm yeah, afraid. It's better than commit suicide, Well, isn't it? I mean, and this is the danger in this kind of apocalyptic vision. You obviously see there's no alternative, but for a lot of people, they would say it's a danger to say that everything is so bad because we'll just throw in the towel, you know? Leave the light bulbs okay. on. Who cares? I don't think so. I don't think that's the normal human reaction. And would you deny telling them the truth? It's, I see myself as very like a physician who's in, in the position, has a patient and the past lab reports back, they've got an invasive cancer. What do you do? I mean, you could say, oh, don't disturb them, let them die, in, uh, die out in peace, but you, you have a duty, I'm afraid, to tell the truth. You would insist that Gaia is very, um, is very solidly founded on hard science. Yes. And yet, it when, it, when it was, it is now. Okay, because I was going to say when it first came out, it was relatively um, embraced by New Agers, by mystics, by, you know, sandal wearers, which is no bad thing, but it wasn't scientific. Did that worry you? did a bit, but it, not all that much. It's uh, all the big theories take about 40 years before they're accepted, and Gaia's just... 41 years old now, mm. and it was this year that it was accepted. Do you think that if you had promulgated the, the hypothesis, the theory earlier, that you might have been able to stave off what you obviously see as a, as a critical situation? That does, that does worry me, and I think the opposition from the biologist was, was quite wrong. Uh, they, they came on so strongly and so dogmatically that it held up progress very... Most other scientists thought, oh, well, we can dismiss this, it's of no consequence. And the problem was it wasn't entirely the biologists' fault. They'd been fighting with creationists, intelligent designers and all sorts, and they got real aggressive. And then when Gaia came along, one senior one told me, we regarded it as the last straw, and we all determined to squash it before it became dangerous. Really? Yeah. So it was a very, very bitter argument. It was in those mm. times, yes. There were a couple of, of predictions um, that you make. One of them is that synthetic food 
uh, will become an issue rather than agriculturally grown food. How realistic do you think that is? Not very, because <laughs> I don't think we'll have time to get there. But looking at it co coolly, if, shall we say, the Japanese, who are pretty high-tech people, and are going to be faced with problems much worse than most because of their population density, I wouldn't put it past them saying, right, we've got the energy, we've got, got the raw materials in the way of carbon dioxide, water and nitrogen, we'll start synthesizing food.